<laughs> okay, folks. Uh, good morning. Good afternoon. However, you're listening. We're, we are really blessed to have Tony Law with us today. Um, I've known Tony Law for about 10, we were just talking off recording here, for about 10 years. Um, it made us both feel really, really quite old. I didn't have kids then, and Tony, um, Tony's hair was jet black, but now it's a silvery, sexy kind of grey. Um, Tony was um, just a remarkable character, actually, when I met him, full of life, full of energy. Um, and at that point, he had a business that he was running, a uh, um, he was doing very well with his kitchen business. It was an active form of income for him. And when I met him, he was just in the transition from moving. And he's got some reasons he's going to share with us as well from business owner into investor. Um, and now he helps as, and amongst doing his own investing in assets and property. He helps other people get on the property ladder and invest in property as well with his business that he'll talk to us about later. Um, now he lives in Bristol and is looking at setting up his new abode to funding um, opportunities for him and his wife to go and see more of the world. So Tony's got three grown up children. Um, he's certainly a dad, um, certainly a husband. Uh, we're going to find out if he's a stress free dad, actually, um, <laughs> but really just a super guy. And and this interview is going to be littered with really interesting subjects and topics. So the gentle theme is around money and business. Um, but ultimately, this is life. This is a life issue. Um, and finding out how Tony does life and who he is, is going to just really help us understand more about what we can and can't do what does and doesn't work. Um, and so we're just so grateful to have Tony Law here, folks. Hey, Tony. <laughs> how am I supposed to follow that as an intro? Uh, how do you? Uh, Hello, Ben. Is it only 10 years mm. uh, since we first met? And um, yeah, I don't think I had jet black hair, but anyway, but it's lovely to be here. And um, I want to try to help and give as much content um, back because, and I didn't mention this in our little preamble before you started recording, but you genuinely helped me donkeys years ago. Uh, when I had a challenge, I'm not going to share that, if that's okay. But mm. You asked me a question, which was, you know, what's the worst that could happen? What's the best that could happen? Let's not talk about what the subject matter was, but it actually made a big impact on me. So if I can in any way help you and any of your kind of listeners, viewers, uh, I'm delighted to do that. Brilliant. Yeah, and, and absolutely the the... the, the summary heading I have for that Tony is there there's the tiny little turning points aren't there and at the moment at that yeah. moment when a turning point offers itself you don't realize the power and the magnitude um, of that moment actually until you kind of look back on reflection and say wow that really was an important conversation not that I'm important but that conversation for you was an important one um, yeah, and I just, when you're in the middle of it, sometimes it's difficult, you know, that old that kind of thing in the middle of the forest, just sometimes it's difficult to actually see a way forward until you could just kind of blurt it out yes. and express it to somebody <laughs> who's willing to listen and maybe yeah. give us genuine feedback, you know. Right. So, uh, yeah. Thank you for then. But this is, <laughs> this is so hopefully yeah. I can help him respond. Um, Tony, can you just give us a whistle stop tour then? I've given you a bit of an intro here. Just give us a bit more yeah. flesh on the bone about how, how, where, where you've gone from there to, to present day, just to put us in the no picture. Problem. Okay, so really briefly, uh, originally from London, uh, I moved down to Bournemouth 30 years ago uh, when I met my wife, Liana. Um, best things ever happened to me. Um, I started off down here... Uh, working selling kitchens i then started up my own kitchen business i ran that for 21 22 years putting in some stupid hours but earning a really good income if i'm being honest with you paid for some really nice holidays um i've never been a car person but i did have some really nice holidays and i sort of built up some income and i thought i was really quite happy at that time I was certainly not unhappy with my job, but I wasn't elated with what I was doing. <laughs> Going out to see Mr. and Mrs. Jones, who's changed the colour on their kitchen doors for the 10th time is not fun, but it was giving a good income. Mm. One day, one of the fittest 
that worked for me. I had six guys working for me. I got a phone call from his wife saying that he died. And that absolutely changed everything for me in that moment. And I've never, I don't think I've ever really told anybody that before, but because I don't really do these kinds of things really open up in this way, but it genuinely in the moment changed everything for me. And I kind of took a bit of time out and kind of reflected upon where I was at and what I was doing. And I decided that I had to make a change. And I just, because I recognized that if something was to happen to me, frankly, my wife and my kids at the time, and they were younger then, they would not be in a great place financially. So I had to make some changes. And that is when I decided to start to get involved in investing in property. Um, and I sort of built a property portfolio and I now find myself in a good position where I've got a nice income. I'm not making fortunes. I still drive around in an, an eight, nine, 10 year old car, which I love. But, um, you know, I, I, I'm not one of those sort of uber successful people that you see out there. I'm in a place where I've got a great income. Uh, or good income from property, but I don't really do an awful lot on a day-to-day -day basis. And, and I think that is something that most people would recognize as being a really good place to be. So that's really kind of brings you pretty much up to where I am today. But the only thing to add on to that is that I also have uh, another business, which is called Your First Four Houses, where I kind of help people and teach people kind of what I did, basically. There's a YouTube channel that you might want to check out um, but yeah, that kind of brings me up to date, really. So, um, yeah, and the whole purpose of this uh, podcast, helping dads, helping men um, build a stress-free life. And, and it's been my experience that stress-free doesn't just land in your lap. You have to build it. You have to cultivate it. You have to understand it. And one of the elements that can contribute ad adversely or positively to that mix is the way we handle and treat money. Um, mm. You just touched on the income from the business, Tony, touched on um, income from property. C can you give us a, what is, tell us about your personal relationship with money and, and take us back a bit. How was that handled? What kind of lessons were you taught about money as a kid? Can you share that with us? Yeah, I, I um. I think I am probably very typical of most people in the, you know, I'm 55 now. And um, when, when, when I was growing up, your parents did not talk about money. It wasn't, it wasn't, it was a taboo subject. It was just almost, well, I guess maybe it was a taboo subject, but your parents didn't talk about it. And I think that is one of the biggest mistakes personally uh, in, 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 in when I was being brought up because my dad was actually quite a successful businessman. Mm. And I will always, he's no longer around, but I will always, if I'm being honest, regret the fact that we never had some interesting conversations about money mm. um, because I would have learned so much from, thank you, just from talking to him, but it never happened. And so, um, yeah ultimately everything that I've managed to pull together, I've largely had to do it just by sort of looking at it from my own perspective, doing my own research, you know, learning in my own time, basically. And um, the nuts and bolts, the budgeting, handling it, what goes where, um, what's enough? How is how was that done in your home, Tony? Let's almost go back to the business days, which is where a lot of the dads listening would be. How did, what was your attitude towards creating? You said you built a really good income. How did you? What what was your inspiration? Why did you want that? How did you create that? What's the difference between a great income and just kind of ticking over for you? Well, I think I think I've always personally. Really, I, I don't find it attractive, that kind of, I'm, I'm not the sort of Ferrari owner, owning kind of, got to have the biggest house kind of, I, I don't, I actually repel against that type of thing. Mm. I always just wanted to find myself in a secure place, financially speaking. Yep. So 
that, that was everything to me because I am a real worrier. I worry about things and I worry about money, if I'm mm. being honest. Mm. Thank you. Um, yeah. I, 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 I've always wanted to find myself into a place, in, in a place where I can be feeling secure, that I have enough income to actually meet all of my outgoings and a little bit more besides. And there was a moment where when I was you know, building up a property portfolio, and I haven't got a massive property portfolio, it's, it's largely debt-free now. I don't have mortgages on several properties, which I'm really pleased about. But it, it's meant that I can get a good income without having to be very highly geared in terms of mortgages. But I remember the point, because one of the things I think people should always really do is get very clear on the amount of money that they need to bring in in order to know that they've got all of their bases covered. In fact, I think that is one of the biggest things that people should do, but they don't do. Mm. They don't get clarity on that. And so I'm talking about covering your basic overheads, not the big expensive holiday, uh, maybe a meal once a week or maybe once a fortnight. You know, what is that number? Working out what it is. And I wrote down what that number was. Uh, and I was really accurate about it. Mm. Um, in fact, I can share a way that you do it, if, you, if that helps. Please, yeah, absolutely, yeah. Uh, okay, so um, this is something that uh, I, I used to talk to people about doing this, because I think it's really good. Um, you should download your last three months' worth of bank statements. And you should do two things. First of all, you should go down that statement, and you should put a little mark next to every single expense that you're not sure about. Like, why the hell am I paying that? What is that expense? Am I paying too much for broadband, for whatever, whatever, as an example? And then you should question that and you should sort of try to, to eliminate or trim down your outgoings. But at some point, you'll get to the point where you have a number. And that is a number that you need to hit. And I remember the day I hit that number, when I, when I, I managed to bring in enough income that I was now covering those basic outgoings. And it is a really, I think it's a really monumentous moment that nobody ever talks about or celebrates, but you blooming well should celebrate it. You should go out for a walk, you know, and just take a moment to look around you and say, something mad has just happened. I've just created an income. And I don't care how you do it. There's loads of ways that you can do it. And a job-based income is wonderful. Although I will always personally fly the flag for somewhat more of an entrepreneurial attitude, I feel. But anyway, that's another issue. You'll hit that target. And when you hit that target, it's a moment to celebrate. Because when you do, everything changes. You know, talking about stress, the stress just dissolves away mm. when you know you're covering those basics. The nice expensive holiday and the big car can come later, but the basics, I think you need to get clear on and you need to cover those basics. That was a very long-winded answer. No, it? it's Sorry. really helpful, actually. <laughs> and, and as you were sharing that with us, I'm, I, I was raised in a very similar way to you. It ne like sex, sex and money were never spoken about. And they're two of the biggest topics I counsel couples about now. Um, and they're looking at the problems unfold with their kids because that's been passed on and they've never spoken to their kids about sex and money either. So the, the, the chaos of history is just repeating itself. So, so I was raised in a way that said, you just, you are, you, who you are is what you bring in. That's that's a measure of a man. How much you 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 money you bring in? How much? Yes, thank you for clarifying 100%. that. Yeah. How much income uh, you bring in? That's people. How people measure you, isn't it? That's what you and, say. And, that, you know, I'm at a dinner party. What do you do? Well, here's my job. Here's my salary. Oh, so you must be worth listening to. Who who's the rich man though? The guy who is absolutely absolutely cocksure of his ex monthly expenses and what he needs to cover and earns an extra grand. So his monthly expenses are two grand. He brings in three, so he's saving twelve grand a year on average. Um, this guy's having a great year. If you're saving saving twelve that is grand a in good a year, place to be. that is a good place to be. But what do we focus on? We focus on the car that you've got parked in the driveway, and, yep. and we've all seen those types of posts and I don't like it 
Mm. I think it's I think it's wrong. You know, I really do feel strongly that it's wrong. And um, but that's the way that is. Uh, you summed it up beautifully. I can't add anything to what you just said. You know, we are assessed. I think as blokes to a large extent, uh, based on the money that you're earning. And, and all the little trimmings that goes hand in hand with that money. I totally agree. I completely agree. And, and you, just how refreshing it would be to go to a networking event where you're not talking about deals and big things to talk about, you know, who's got the biggest set of balls. It's, do you know what, Tony? Nice to see you. I haven't seen you for 10 years, but, you know, for the first time in 10 years, I'm 20 quid above my budget. It's taken me 10 years to get there. This month, I made 20 pounds clear cut from that bang on accurate number you told me to get in that podcast that I recorded with you 10 years ago. So thank you for that. <laughs> right? It's such a simple thing, but I'd love to know the numbers of who actually does that. What is that exact figure of what life, co what I cost the world? I need You need to know that number, really. And I guess um, there's a caveat of um, this is an absolute fact, our joint opinion is if you don't have that number there is how do you know where you are how do you know what's enough there, there's never enough you know because you is it 1800 is it 2200 is it you know where are you and without knowing that number it just builds stress lack of clarity around that builds stress well can i just it's really interesting that you say those you just said 1800 2000 or whatever it's really interesting that you mentioned those two numbers because I have a I have a website and, 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 and you know and, and I recently did a survey of how much money and I asked very specifically how much money people needed to earn to get to that point of I refer to it as I'm going to do this I hate this financial freedom but it seems appropriate then um, and and I was clear on what that was it was you know as I've just alluded to covering your bare bone basics. And I was really quite surprised at how low, and I had hundreds of people give me the number, not mm. two, five, ten, hundreds of people came back to me what that, with what that monthly number was. And do you know what? It was 1,800, 2,000, 2,000. No way. I didn't expect it. I expected it to be, oh, I need 10,000 pounds a month to cover my, to cover my basic outcomes. It wasn't. It was a perfectly reasonable perfectly reasonable number um, and I do think I think a big reason it can be a lower number is if you take control of your expenses you don't need to spend fortunes to have a really nice lifestyle like Liana and I have got we've got a great lifestyle now I think <laughs> I hope, hope Liana feels the same way mm. but and, and uh, uh, we have got a nice income but you know what you don't need, if you're relatively frugal uh, and you keep control of your overheads, um, you can have a fantastic lifestyle and minimize, not eliminate, minimize the stress. Um, because I think a lot of stress, and obviously you'd agree with this, Ben, comes from money, doesn't it? The stress is really. Absolutely. Dirt. Lack of clarity around money. Um, is a big, big contentious point in, in for couples um, because you're bringing a topic to the table and you've inherited a whole load of history, generations of history of how money should and shouldn't be dealt with. And it is, it's almost it's so rare that a couple walks in here and they're like, yeah, we are absolutely completely aligned on money. We know exactly what we cost the world. We know exactly how much we earned to the penny last month. And we know how much we saved. Um, it's just, it's just so rare. We're like, we're there or thereabouts to the tune of five, six, seven, eight hundred quid. Like what, 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 where's that money going? And he looks at her and she looks at him and they've got <laughs> no idea. And so, and so this is so sobering because I think the word um, to, to, to bring a level of consciousness to the choices you're making all right we're making this and this isn't about money because we can extrapolate this into all areas of life really to bringing a level of consciousness to how i am treating something that i use all the time so love money or hate it is up to you most of us use it somehow and so your relationship with it really matters actually if you if you want to build a stress-free life like some of you might not want to but 
But there's, there's this great phrase, a, a friend of ours, uh, Jilly. Um, yes. Comparison is the thief of joy. Oh, great phrase. Comparison is the thief of joy. Yeah. Now, it's not her phrase, um, but it's one that she shared with me. And I feel, oh, I really like that. I really like that because I'm the worst for that. I, and I think, if I'm being honest, I think everyone does it. I'm sure even you do it, Ben. Yeah, I do. You can, Absolutely. You can't help yourself comparing. You can't help but compare yourself to others. You know? my, 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 the dumbest comparison I make is the comparison of where I am against where I think I should be. So let, let go of, like, I do enough comparing to all the Land Rover, Range Rover drivers that are out here in the forest. I, I compare where I am to where I think I should be. And that kills me because I convince myself where I should be is where I actually should be right now, which is insane. Where, it where I am, absolutely. It just crushes yeah. you. It crushes your spirit. So it, it completely um, makes you completely ungrateful for one, for what, what gifts you've had to actually get you to this point. It's no, no, this isn't enough. You need to be over there. That has absolutely killed me, to be honest. And I don't know what the answer is to that because I'm not going to pretend to you that I don't still do that. I do. Yes. I, th I think it's really hard. I think it, it was, for me, it was sobering having somebody say that to me because it did make me think, oh, I really am guilty of that. But it doesn't, it, but it doesn't change the fact that I still do it. Yeah. I just yeah. pull myself up on it. I think what I try to do now personally is ignore what other people are doing and just do what I want to do. And, you know, like with any content that I might put out on YouTube, I, I kind of just do what I want now. And it's usually geared around a question that someone's asked or a problem that I thought, well, that's an interesting thing. And so I'll just generate some content based on that. And, and you know what? I tell you what's really interesting. Since I changed that approach, uh, I get maybe less views or less you know, subscribers because I'm doing more of stuff that I kind of want to do. Mm -hmm. And I'm all right with that, actually. Because I, I know, I know perfectly well what I could do tomorrow that would generate the most amount of interest, and I know what. But actually, that's not what I want to do. I want to do this thing over here, mm. and I'm I'm now slowly coming to terms with the fact that I'm all right with that. I'm all right with because, um, especially in the world of kind of putting in, you know, if you if you are going to be putting any content out there, it's, you, you're kind of initially striving to get all the views and all the eyeballs and the audio and you know but actually when you have got a reasonable amount of people looking at your stuff i think it's lovely to be able to switch to stuff that you're more interested in mm. uh, we were talking about um before we came on recording here about i genuinely have an interest in spooky houses not ghosts or anything like that i don't believe in anything like that. <laughs> but spooky run down neglected old worn out properties i like that i find them fascinating and so i want to do more focus on looking at those types of properties not just you know maybe doing you know the, the buying and refurbishing of them but maybe just exploring them because i find those interesting you know anyway sorry ben. yeah that is great tony uh, and 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 um yeah for something that was brought to my attention was that the, the goal is to become aware almost on the theme of what you helped us with there of how how to get that figure what we're what are we really working from what's the foundation is become aware so so to even people listening now to to to, to 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 develop that awareness of hey i've just made a whopping great big comparison i've best made a judgment that i am blank blank compared to or i am blank blank com or i'm less than or more than like just catching yourself making that kind of judgment, that comparison is a really helpful step. If you haven't made that step, you're just completely identified with and locked in to the head madness, the head chaos that says, yeah, th this is an effective way to go through life, comparing yourself to this that, and the other. It's not, it's, it's miserable and breeds stress, right? So we don't need to chop limbs off here if you just gently bring an awareness to oh yeah i've just judged me against that guy and what he's driving just witness you do that for me when i get there it diffuses so much of the energy i go yeah that's that's what you've just done and, and yeah. you know what that, that's that's the best i got right now because 
if I can take a, as much energy as I can out of that, it just gets me back to being present. I'm holding Carrie's hand. I'm holding Florence's yeah. hand. I'm just sat on this chair. It's not really rocket science. It's quite simple. And so many of us, I believe, think it's got to be way more complicated than that. Perhaps the ultimate solution is. But if you can just take a step of, hey, I've just caught myself to it. Peace, I think, is the antidote to stress, uh, ultimately. So, Tony, right. if, I can, if I can bring you back to your relationship with Liana, um, how... How has money managed to between you guys? Can you share that with us? And even if it's not ideal, that's great as well, because that would teach us something. <laughs> but how are how have financial decisions been made in your home? Because there is just as an important person in this household called Liana. You made a big business decision. It was a turning point for you. How does Liana look at money? Where does she fit in? How is she involved? Blah, blah, blah. Okay, so I'm really worried about sharing this one because it's probably not in alignment with what I should be saying then but I, I'm just going to be honest tell us how <laughs> it is yeah <laughs> so the truth is I think I have a very uh yeah, I'm feeling embarrassed almost saying this I think I have quite an old-fashioned I think Liana and I have quite an old-fashioned relationship sure and um you know I I, I emphasize she is the best thing uh, that's ever happened to me I better say that just in case she tunes in um, but she genuinely is, and you know, you know Liana, she's, she's awesome. Yeah, yeah. I do. But we do have, a, I think, a fairly old-fashioned relationship, and I'm actually not going to make any apologies for that. Mm. I think we are very, we have always been fairly um, clear in the division of who kind of looks after what, who manages what. Um, I have always kind of taken responsibility for the financial side of things. And that includes on a day-to-day -day level managing the money bit. And it also includes the bigger picture. It includes, you know, the businesses that we've got. And, you know, when I was working, um, you know, any of the big changing decisions financially. Of course we would discuss it. Of course we would. But ultimately it was always clear I was the one that was making those decisions. But with Liana's utter and complete support and some of the decisions were really difficult and um one of the brilliant things that liana was always awesome at was just i would do you know i've not really thought about this until this moment i would talk and she would just give feedback and and, and she's just this brilliant sounding board that mm -hmm. i could bounce ideas off of and she would give really awesome feedback on those ideas, often not what I wanted to hear, but she would just say the truth and say it as she saw it, but ultimately it was, it was me to make that decision. On the other hand, we've got three kids, three awesome kids who've grown up to be three awesome adults in three great relationships. I, I, I have to say that I kind of, she's largely was in control of that aspect, if I'm mm. being honest. Mm. So I don't know that I think, okay, if I'm being honest, I could maybe reflect back and say, did I, should I have spent more time, you know, in those early years with the, with the kids? And I think if I'm being honest, yeah, I think probably I should have done. But I can't, I have to say what we have and had worked brilliantly, actually, you know? Yeah. Even though we were not, you know, again, I was kind of financial, Leon was sort of family and we would come together. So we would always share, but ultimately the, the, we had very clear lines as to who would be handling what. Is that okay? I think it's. I think it's because why it's absolutely okay is because it absolutely is working for you, Tony. It works for you guys. That might not work for everybody. Key, key point for me is you guys have been very clear, and you even used the word clear. What is the, you didn't say labor, but what is the division of labor? And you used the word responsible right a word that used to terrify me but i now i see it's just perhaps the most empowering word in my vocabulary because when i am clear about who is responsible for what i'm clear about what i'm not responsible for at the very same time so yeah. ultimately you're responsible and you're accountable for those results but you um include liana um in all of the particularly like oh liana should i should i now pay this direct debit 
why would you need to pay? What do I need to pay this bill here? Do you think that's a, should I do that now or at 2 p.m. in the afternoon? We don't mean that. Choices that are going to affect your lifestyle. Um, Liana's input matters just as much as yours. Ultimately, in your household, you have the final say, and that's okay. Ultimately, you do need someone that just says, right, okay, bugger it. We're going to do it. We've put everything we've got on the table. All of your input matters, and I think that's the value here. Tony gets the final say because this is Tony's bag. That's his responsibility. Liana's input is included, and what a blessing that is, that she doesn't necessarily – change your decisions she's just giving you some feedback have you considered this have you considered that what a beautiful arrangement she's like your financial coach and you haven't really <laughs> realized it i think my conscience is maybe it is a, is a good way or, or that that little voice on your shoulder is maybe but um i think maybe i think i can kind of get away with saying that a bit more because i think that you know our lifestyle is I, I, I don't like the word entrepreneurial because it sounds so naff, but I think because I'm immersed in the business, like for example, when I had a kitchen business, Liana's not involved in the business. How can she really have uh, as big an input in some of the decisions that would be involved in the kitchen business, if that makes sense? The same mm. is true with property and the same is true with the, with the training stuff. And so, and so she's, you know, I think to have, I think the biggest mistake a lot of people make is that they don't talk to their partner. And, and how that interaction happens, you know, is obviously down to the individual. It would be stupid, in my opinion, this is your territory, Ben, not mine, but in my opinion, it would be stupid to not talk openly and have a clear dialogue, clearly share um, some of the bigger questions and issues and challenges and decisions that have to be made made but i i just feel that you know what we have is a good way um in that we have a clear you know line as to who decides what again i, I hope that that's okay. yeah <laughs> it's really helpful because when there isn't clarity when there isn't an open page there's either fear lurking in there somewhere or it breeds fear and it's fear that kills marriage. It's not, it's not, <laughs> it's not actually the husband and wife that kill the marriage. It's fear that does. Um, so it doesn't matter where you are or what that looks like. Uh, we encourage all couples to just open that page. It's one of many topics that we suggest on opening the page on. And it has to be open at all times. Um, and whenever anyone feels uncomfortable about it, it has to be raised and books opened, um, pun intended, and look at the numbers. You know, where are we? I just want to get clear on where we are because you never know when the person who is the partner who's be, just been sat on the fringes just wakes up and says, I really want to take an interest in this. I want to take more responsibility. I get that I've left it all to you. I want to understand that a little bit more. So. Um, yeah, just recommending dads to always have that page open and never exclude your partner from having an input. I mean, there, there is one other little thing that I, because I, I, I recognize that, the, that your listeners are going to be split into various camps when it comes to this particular subject. Yes. But, the, but, I, but I also think you would acknowledge that there are going to be a percentage of your listeners that will probably be a little more like me in that they would maybe be the financial people in the house so one of the things i always encourage people to do and i've certainly done this is i list out all in great detail all of our financial situation so that if something was to happen to me tomorrow i have a very easy to follow go-to reference that can be followed but again i again i recognize that our situation is maybe somewhat more complex than somebody that's working in a job for example but you know you know, each of the properties, what they should do with them, what they should do with any investments that we've got. Again, they can do whatever they want because I won't be around, but I wanted to have something that would be an easy to follow document that could just be picked up and go, all right, okay, this is, again, um, sounds a bit morbid that, but I think that's, if you're, if you are with that, in that camp, I think that's nothing but a good thing. So that, you know, and, I, and I've run through it with Liana, but uh, Liana, we, we went through it, so she can see exactly what it's all about. And of course, that in itself stops her from worrying because of she course. can see that if something happened, there is a, there is a plan. 
<laughs> for, yeah, I just don't exclude that subject of death. Like Kerry and I, <laughs> Kerry and I talk about it all the time. <laughs> we don't talk about it all the time, but I don't know when it's going to happen. I, I don't know when it's going to happen. Right. No. But there's something you are absolutely not in control of. And there is a piece about um, in, in terms of the responsibility of loving your family beyond when you're going to go. And there, there's going to be enough pain and stuff that comes up for your family if you go first. It, it could happen. There's a percent probability of likelihood. I, who, who knows? Um, and so to just take all the energy again out of all that stress and fear of here it is love all laid out mm. uh, i don't know if you say the word love in in london but it's all laid out for you here's what you got to do here are the numbers here's where you have to go and having that conversation so they're prepared in the event of something going wrong i think that mm. is that's wise parental uh, yeah there's wisdom in it um what why wouldn't you do life that way as i said fear just tries to weave its way into any area in life where you don't have clarity. The good news is you don't need to be perfect. And if you're, if there are areas in life when you're where you're unclear, you just have an opportunity to start peeling that back and start to question, even as a, on the back of this interview, what, what one thing could I do differently? And it might just be going to have a conversation with my wife or partner tonight about where we're at and what's good about where we're at and what's bad about where we're at just make that difference and, and just witness the impact of that. And, and do it as a meeting. Have, have fun with it. Yeah. yeah have, have fun with it, but have a kind of like a board meeting, you know, or, or, I'm obviously hamming this up here, but yep. do it in a somewhat more formal way because yep. suddenly that puts a bit of gravitas into the moment, you know? And I, you know, you know, this is, we're going to take this semi-seriously. Let's look at what we're doing. Let's, let's think forward. Very, so many people, again, maybe I'm talking out of turn here, Ben, uh, but I think too many people bury their heads in the sand. And, and I think that is a, a big error because um, there's always a way forwards. Um, it might not be obvious, but there's always a way forwards. And I think communication, talking, and in particular, planning. It is is the best it's the best thing that you can do to sit down and plan with your partner yeah i i heard a i heard a phrase years ago and i didn't like it because i knew i was guilty of it at the time um what, what you don't know does hurt you this expression is what you don't know doesn't hurt you it's the biggest crock of shit oh um biggest crock of poo um <laughs> I've heard because because what I didn't know led me into financial ruin at one point in my life. You know, what I don't know about Kerry and who she is will lead to problems in my relationship. What I don't know about what my kids are up to will lead to problems in their growth and my ability to parent and love them. What you don't know does hurt you. We love formal meetings in our house. We have formal para, um, family meetings. We have formal relationship reviews. We have formal business reviews. We have formal money reviews. Because as you said, that, that formality actually brings an air of um, gravitas. It brings an air of magic. It brings a, a, an air mm. of intention to it. It's a, I, in our home anyway, is a very positive thing. So if you were building a business, you would pay a lot of attention to your vision, your plan, um, the numbers. Your, your, your home is essentially a business with people that plug into it. It's, it's something that should be taken very seriously. But it should be taken more seriously. Than more, business. thank you, this yeah. Is, this is where you're spending your, this is your life we're talking about here. It would be, you know, you, you should be putting more focus on forward planning in your life um and of course no people don't do they people don't put enough effort in they'll they'll go to a, they'll go to a business meeting but they won't actually put the time in at home i would again maybe i'm talking out of turn here but they won't put the time in at home to to plan to forward think um even if it's only over the next six to 12 months but i do think we should all have some kind of a plan Tony, we're almost at the end here. Um, I would love you to share with us. Um, your, you've already shared some great stuff here. Uh, your, your, your top two tips, really. Uh, it's very difficult because, like you said, there are lots of different camps where it's very difficult to have a generic two top tips. Um, 
for building stress-free, targeting men that are not in an amazing financial position right now, um, what can they do to improve that? Um, and, and let's have one bullet point for them and one bullet point of top tip for guys that are getting their head above water, making stuff start to work. How can they do a little bit better with where they are? Does that question make sense? A tip for both camps. Can I only give you two? Only two. Sorry. Yeah, that's all we've got time for. Okay. Okay. First one then. Um, go and Google all the financial advice you'll ever need fits on a single index card. All the financial advice you'll ever need fits on a single index card. Now that's a YouTube video. It, it doesn't promote anything. It's four years old. And it is a brilliant video that will cover all of the basic stuff that we should all be doing. So that's my first suggestion for people that just want to get a basic basic hold on what they should and shouldn't be doing, the fundamental things. Mm -hmm. um, I think the next thing is, um, so I don't know which camp that would actually fall into. Which camp would you say that one fell into? I think that's kind of both really, but I guess more the former of the dads that are just wanting to get a, get things by the scruff of a neck, uh, haven't been that in a great place. That. Yep. that is brilliant for that. And what was the second one you wanted to cover? Guys that are, business is ticking over, doing quite well, um, making some savings. They've got a handle on things. Um, where are they heading? What could those group of guys be doing differently okay uh, you need to make a plan now you, you uh, uh, that sounds really naff and weak and saying that but you you need to be very proactive in your decisions now so i would suggest you sit down with a blank piece of paper and you work out where you're going to be in not five years time. I am not a five years time planning person. Six to 12 months, I think is a reasonable time scale. And in particular, you wanna, you wanna write down in a few sentences, three or four sentences, a vision of where you want to be. Where is your perfect place? Let's say six months from today, maybe 12 months from today. Because having a target, something to aim for, is essential. Otherwise, you don't know where you're going. And I mm. think you should do it and write it out in such a way as if you've actually achieved that target, as if you've achieved that goal. Having that clarity on where you're going means you've got something to aim for. You've got a target to hit. If you don't have that clarity, if you don't write down where you want to be six to 12 months from now, how on earth are you going to make any decisions because you don't know where you're going? So if you're at that point where you're starting to achieve, if I'm being honest, get out of the house, go to a quiet space where you haven't got any distractions and write down your vision of where you want to be six to 12 months from today. Once you've done that, it's relatively straightforward to work out the stepping stones that will actually get you to that place. It's so brilliant. People listening in are worried about making sure their batteries are charged up for work the next day, making sure they got enough money ready for next day. What are they going to eat for their lunch? Um, you, you, you can become um, industry. What's the word? Um, not indoctrinated, institutionalized, even in your own business by going to do the do. And, and it takes so much energy and effort to actually get that, that wheel turning. And you get so preoccupied with that wheel turning is so, so, so focused on that. It's so easy to lose sight of what you were initially setting out to achieve with that. And that might've changed in the course of 12, 24 months. Um, even just a couple of years, it might change and that's okay. You're suggesting we just tune, just spend a little bit of time tuning back in with, are we in line with the plan we made, whether we made one or not? Where where do we where are we going? You know, it's the equivalent of setting out for a walk, and you know where you're going to go for the first mile, and you get to the end point, and then you just kind of sit down and don't really wonder where else we should go from here. It's well, how do you hope to get to the final destination if you've only been clear on the first mile? It, that's not 
boring tony actually i think you've really done that justice there and um hopefully people will really take that on board i, I will put a link to your video in the bio um as well as the stuff you're just about to share with us in terms of your business and how we might be able to dial into some more of your content and help you can you give us that information well the only thing i was going to sort of say is if, if you want to check out any of the stuff that i do if you go onto youtube and you just search for your first four houses and that is f-o-u-r <laughs> your first four houses uh, just go onto youtube and you'll see i've done some videos on there um, that might help people um, your first four houses, the concept of that is essentially, I don't think you need 20, 30, 40, 50 plus houses to be financially free. I think four or five properties is all you actually need to be financially free. But for, the, for your benefit, Ben, and for the benefit of your listeners, I don't care whether you actually do property or whatever. I do feel that you should be... Um, taking responsibility and looking at, I think, taking a slightly more entrepreneurial mindset and looking at starting up something. It doesn't have to be property, it can be something else. But the first four houses, if you want to check out what I do, obviously there's some stuff there that you might find helpful. Thank you, Tony. I'll be dropping that all into the bio link so men don't even have to worry about how to find it. You can just scroll down and find it there. This has been a real gem, actually. It's a level of uh, dialogue uh, and connection that we haven't had, both been different men in the past. And yeah, we're just really grateful that you were able and willing to make the time to be here with us today, Tony. So my pleasure. best of luck, buddy. All of our love to Liana, letting you out of the cupboard for this hour for us. Um, <laughs> hopefully she just puts you back in. She'll uh, be back in a minute, been my pleasure and it's lovely to catch up with you on a personal level ben yeah you genuinely have helped me in the past and so uh, it's lovely to catch back up with you again and i hope some of this stuff has been of some help thanks buddy have a great day tony see you mate bye-bye